I really don't think that little gray beings are anything but clones and machines and that kind of thing. He said, when we did the autopsy of the being and we pulled, peeled off the eye, uh, eye covering, it was an eye covering. In other words, it was a lens. And he said, I had that lens. And we'd walk up and down the halls of the Pentagon and we could see the furniture at night. He said, we weren't worried about the beings. He said, we were worried about who created them. I'm delighted today to introduce a truly remarkable guest. As an investigative journalist and esteemed researcher, she has made significant impact into the field of extraterrestrial and UFO phenomena. Paula Harris has an impressive track record of interviewing key military and government figures worldwide, intriguing witness accounts that prompt us to rethink our understanding of these enigmatic phenomena. She is also author of several thought-provoking books, such as Connecting the Dots, Making Sense of the UFO Phenomena, and Exopolitics, All the Above, which showcase her expertise and passion for the subject. Not only is Paula an accomplished writer, she is also a sought-after speaker at conferences where she captivates audiences with her knowledge and genuine enthusiasm for uncovering the truth behind UFOs and extraterrestrial encounters. I'm an investigative journalist and there's nothing that supports this subject matter. So you have to kind of have another job to be able to go around the world and do the interviews and get the information. Plus, I love teaching. I taught ancient history, um, Shakespeare. Uh, I, I've taught um, English. Uh, in high school, most of my life. So in 1992, I went to Italy. I'm Italian. Uh, my name is Paola Harris. I, I, I was born in Italy. And in 1992, I went to um, Italy to teach at the American Overseas School of Rome. So what would happen is that I would teach at this private school and then do research in Europe. But you asked me what was how I got started, and it's not a normal subject. So, Paul, that's a good question. Well, I began teaching in the United States, and they gave me the class science fiction. So I had to teach all the famous, you know, uh, books and science fiction like Dune and all H.G. Wells and the Time Machine and all those, and and Bradbury and everything. And at that time, this movie came out called Close Encounters of the Third Kind, came out in 1980, and I was teaching here in 1980, so I went to see it, and I had an emotional reaction to the very end of the film, where this French scientist, played by Francois Truffaut, um, has a contact with these aliens, now never in a million years did I dream I'd ever meet the guy that that film was made up uh, from? I, uh, now in the last five years, I've been working with Jacques Vallée. It was made, uh, you know, mirroring the career of Jacques Vallée, the, uh, the scientist from France. Yeah. And But as I saw this movie, uh, I knew that J Dr. Jalen Hynek had been working with Blue Book and I had a wedding in Evanston, Illinois, where the Center for UFO Studies was, and that's where he was. So I never thought he'd be there because, you know, he just was such a famous personality. He had been doing Project Blue Book. So, But I went to the, to the Kufos and walked into the offices, and there he was. And he said to me, would you work with me? Uh, because you speak Italian, I have all these Italian cases. So I started working with him until he died in 1986. So Paul, when I'm working with an astronomer who did Project Blue Book, who Close Encounters was made, that I knew it was real. There is no mythology there. That's a scientist. So yeah. I, I became interested because I was working with the right people. Oh, it's, inc it's incredible. And how long have you been doing this work? I mean... I'm guessing many decades at least. Well, yeah, because I never was interested in any of this uh, until um, until 1980. So 40 years, about 40 years. I started with him 
And then I, I, I did so much work. Uh, I was a journalist that brought Colonel Philip Corso, who wrote the book, The Day After Roswell. He was a colonel at the Pentagon who back engineered the, the artifacts for the Roswell crash. I mean, th these are serious people uh, who, who worked in, in big top projects. So my job is, has been, you know, just to, to reach out to uh, scientists, the intelligence community, Clifford Stone, who was in the Army too, who did crash retrieval and actually dealt with live and dead uh, uh, aliens uh, with extraterrestrials. And I was, able, because these are military people. And then one of my closest friends was Edgar Mitchell, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut. Now, when dealing with all these kinds of people, then you know that this is not a mythology. It's not a joke. It's what you're doing is trying to follow the breadcrumbs to get enough information so that you can give it to the general public. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think that there is, I mean, you, in your opinion, why, why is there so much cover up around this area, do you think? What was the main reason for that? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, I, I mean, I'm going to talk about this because it's important. The first UFO crash was not Roswell. It was 1945. Jacques Vallée and I wrote a book about it. One month after the atomic bomb, two little kids see the crash. They see the beings, and there's messages there. And of course, it's about the atomic bomb. So you think that at that time, whatever Army Air Force, and they were together, are going to throw whatever they found in uh, because the the, cra the the vehicle was there. You think they're going to throw this stuff in the trash? No. And even when Roswell happened, that craft did not go in the trash. And if you read Ryan Wood's book, um, Magic Eyes Only, there are 92 crashes all over the world. James Fox just did a movie called Moment of Contact on the Brazilian Virginia case. <laughs> the stuff in the trash. So what you have is almost 70 years of technology that has been um, uh, sheltered in the top level black projects or industry. When, when um, Eisenhower said, beware of the military industrial complex, what he said was the government has no, has no uh, you know, jurisdiction over this. It goes into private industry to make money. Mm. So why private industry to make money want to tell the truth about where they got the patents, where they got the materials? And I only found this out because of the testimony of Colonel Philip Corso, who's a brave man, in, in the book, The Day After Roswell. That came out in 1997 for people that do read, um, that want to look at the historical impact of this. Mm. Oh, it's incredible stuff, even as you're you're saying that so many questions are arising. Do you so you think it's more to do with private enterprise? Obviously, follow the money. I always say rather than yeah. it just being a government. Because I, from my understanding, a lot of people in lower government have no idea really what's going on. It's only in the higher echelons, or when we get into the military industrial complex that some of these people are aware of this stuff, but it's not a broadly obviously known thing, right? Well, no, first of all, Colonel Corso used to say to me, Paula, don't, when you say the government, which government they change every four years, mm. you know, was like, <laughs> what, what are you talking about? You know, the, the, the general people, the, the senators and the council, they don't, they don't know. And they're really not interested because who wants to touch this stuff? The other thing that you have to understand, I think, is that they don't know what's going on. And after 40 years, if you say, Paula, do you know what's going on? I'll say, no, but you can connect the dots. That's what the name of the book is, Connecting the Dots. Mm -hmm. if, if you talk to enough people, uh, you'll figure it out. But when you have the government and, and the United States government, especially that has separation of, of uh, Air Force, army and navy they're all vying for contracts even it, like the air force i'm sure because the air force i'm sure has 
artifacts, but they didn't talk about it. Colonel Corso was army. Uh, and he, he told us, and I have his videos because uh, I brought him to Italy twice. He said, the reason why we have this stuff is to enhance the competitive edge of the army. In other words, we, we could get the contracts because we had stuff to say, um, can you back engineer this? And, and an interesting story, Paul, that he told me was, he said, um, Paula, he said, when the beings, so, and he called them clones. I mean, I, I really don't think that little gray beings are anything but clones and machines and that kind of thing. He said, when we did the autopsy of the being and we pulled, peeled off the eye, uh, eye covering, it was an eye covering. In other words, it was a lens. And he said, I had that lens. And we'd walk up and down the halls of the Pentagon and we could see the furniture at night. He said, we weren't worried about the beings. He said, we were worried about who created them. Mm. So over your years of research, have you come to that conclusion of who created uh, these, you know, you might want to call them, um, you know, synthetic life forms? Do you have any idea? No. I don't have any idea. However, since the United States is engulfed in only abductions and these little life forms, they never bothered to look at the 1950s where human type aliens came off ships and spoke to the people in Southern California. And if you want to do your homework, go and look up George Van Tassel, Adamski, uh, Orfeo Angelucci, um, and Howard Menger, because they not only have photographs of these beings, these people, I'm going to call them people, but it was an attempt for a group. And they said they came from Venus. I don't think they came from Venus. That, that we know Venus, so they use the word Venus. But I, I mean, you don't think that people that live on Venus call themselves Venus. Uh, that's a, a planetary, that's us. Uh, we, so they, they, they talked to um, not only the group at Giant Rock in Southern California and Landers, California, but they also came to the island of Sicily, those same people, blonde, blue-eyed, uh, and talked to Eugenio Siracusa, our contactee, who was told, just like a Dempsey, go around the world, tell people to come together and stop lose, uh, using nuclear power. But nobody does their homework. Nobody reads the past. I mean, nobody bothers to look at this chronologically or on a geopolitical level. So after 1970, where all the Space Brother movement was in Southern California, they ended up going to the Chilka Desert in Peru and talking to Sisto Poswells and all of his South American contactees. And that's where the real meat is now. That's where I'm spending most of my time. Because yeah. what's happening in South America, in the Chilka Desert, in Peru, the, these guys, they camp there for three days, they fast, the ships land, and people come off. And I've interviewed all kinds of witnesses, all kinds. I've even gone to Canada to, to uh, I've driven myself to Canada to, to interview um, uh, Sisto's brother. Uh, who lives in near Toronto. And, you know, they all tell the same story that these uh, ETs come off the ship and they come and with the message of coming together. Now, they're not going to come back to the United States after the 1970s. Why would they? <laughs> and all we care about is the ship. I mean, even what's coming out of Washington when they talk about the Tic Tacs and, you know, air, uh, the, uh, the airplanes seeing these crap. They never address who's inside. So you think that whoever's flying out around there wants to come here? Uh, mm. They've already done that, been there, done that in the 50s, 60s, and mm. 70s. Mm. They have gone to Italy. They've gone to Virginia in, in Brazil. They've gone to, uh, I've even done the Billy Meyer case in Switzerland. I mean, the thing is that a lot of these human-type beings um, are interested in giving a message, but it's up to us to digest it. And 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 I love when people say, oh, that isn't a UFO. It's too, the picture is just too clear. 
I'd be always saying, did you know Photoshop wasn't invented in 92? And most of the 1992, and most of these photos are 1970. So nothing is CGI before that. So the problem is this, our own UFO community debunks our own work. They don't get together and discuss it like you would discuss geology, anthropology, history, or any other academic subject. It's become a media circus. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And then, it, you know, it comes to my next question about, you know, we, we have a lot of people within what you call the UFO community or the uh, consciousness community that, you know, has so much detailed information, almost to the point that it's unbelievable about, you know, meeting a certain amount of races and having personal contact with them and having meetings and being in secret um, 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 government uh, groups. I mean, do you look at some of these claims? Obviously, you're an investigative journalist. Do you have you seen this sort of pattern over the years? I know many people I've interviewed have spoken about this, um, but I wanted to hear your view on what your reaction is when you see some of these maybe bogus claims coming forward do you think it does a lot of damage to the to the overall community well it creates a mythology mm. you know i mean really i really have not found that any ets have ever worked with the government mm. i have found in charles hall case that there was an exchange of technology at area 51 mm. but he was he's there for the guy is Air Force. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, <laughs> I'm talking to an Air Force guy who worked as a weatherman on that base. He has all his credentials. Um, the problem is this, and I, I don't know how to explain it, but it might help your viewers. I was very close friends with Monsignor Balducci of the Vatican because when I lived in Italy, we used to have dinner on Sunday all the time. And he used to say, Paula, the devil doesn't eat UFOs. And then <laughs> he would say, you know, there's many dimensions where there is negative beings, but they're not ET. And people can create negativity and even beings. I mean, we've got a whole host of things in dimensionality. We've got ghosts. We've got negative beings. We've got, um, you know, your ancestors. We have all of those levels of weirdness. But they're, they're not necessarily extraterrestrial. And I think that when some people say they've had contact, they, they've had contact with beings from other dimensions that are not ET. Yeah. They, uh, they, in other words, they've had, they have a vibration where they attract that type of being. But what I've learned from the actual visitations, uh, the real ones, is that there's an agenda there, and it isn't uh, uh, like um, Clifford Stone said, he never encountered a negative agenda. Uh, Clifford Stone, crash retrieval, said he had a manual with 57 different races, and he had to have the manual because they were doing crash retrieval and they didn't want to kill any of them. Uh, and they had to make sure they didn't put alcohol on them or do something where they'd kill them because they were administering first aid. And he told me the stories that three of his crash retrievals were in Vietnam. And I said, well, what were you doing there? And he said, they were watching the war. And I said, you're kidding. And he goes, no. He said, and we were told to go into a cave and blow up the cave because ETs were in there. Mm. And, and, he, and, and when he said he went in there, part of the cave, he said, was transparent. You could see the war going on. And and the ET that was in there that does not follow reptilian gray or Nordic. In fact, he said he would look like amphibian almost, turned around to Clifford and said, what are you people doing over here? So, you know, I, I'm looking, I said, so Clifford, in all the crash retrievals, you did 12. You don't think any of them were um, negative suspect situations? He goes, no. He, he said what I thought they were doing, and I love the words, he said they were cosmic anthropologists. Mm. Yeah, well. 
and this is coming from an army man who was indoctrinated into the army at 16. He didn't know he was going to do this, but somebody in the army knew he had psychic abilities because he had had contact when he was 10 years old. So they got him in there because most people that have psychic abilities, you know, whatever communication goes on does not go on because you use words. It's direct thought transfer. They have to be psychic people or people that are in remote viewing or something. Most of the ones, including the intelligent, Michael Wolf in the intelligence community, he was a remote viewer. He remote viewed bin Laden. He remote viewed the French, the um, Red Brigade in Italy. I mean, so we're dealing with a, we're dealing with a very complex subject. We're dealing with psychic ability, uh, communication, um, time travel in South America. My God, I, I can't even wrap my mind around that. The, oh, I'd love to story. ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. But the current story that I, you know, that I'm dealing with in Peru is all about time traveling. And I, I, it's hard for me because I'm a very stable person. I'm a very a black and white person. I have had to go from not wanting to know what was inside to dealing with contact with this stuff. And it's not easy uh, because we're not, nobody ever teaches us mm. anything. Nobody ever tells us that the world, the reality that we're looking at isn't really the reality. Nobody yeah. opens our minds. I remember I loved him so much, jo Dr. John Mack, Harvard University. Mm. Uh, when I was with him in Florence, he said to me, Paula, he said, we need to change our world view to accommodate this reality not that we shove it into our worldview because our worldview is like number three and the worldview that we have to shove it into is like number a hundred so you know we are very limited uh beings on this planet where we can't think that far we can't go there and 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 john mack who's you know he he, he was a psychiatrist he was He's not somebody off the street, you know, he's in Harvard saying we need to accommodate our worldview to because this is real. And and he never thought it was sentence either. Mm. So when, when my colleagues start making value judgments, I feel like saying, don't do that because you don't know what's really happening here because we have, in order to make sense of this and not go insane, we try to put it in a box and there is no box. Yeah, I wanted to, I, I want to ask you about John Mack, but then I want to go back to what we were just talking about with the time travel. There's been a lot of suspicion over the years. Uh, I'll get your opinion on this as to John Mack's death. I believe he was killed in London. He was obviously hit by... Uh, that was an accident. I knew him very well. He had just been at my house in Rome because okay. we were very... I had him speak in Florence. I was his... Um, his interpreter, and I hate to say this because he'll <laughs> shoot me, but when he came to Rome, he was pickpocketed and he lost his cell phone and his camera mm. <laughs> on, the, on the metro. And I never left him alone at that age. He was he was almost, he was in his 70s, I think, right. late 70s. Yeah. I, and my mother and I accompanied him everywhere. Here he is at 10 o'clock at night walking around London uh, and and, yeah. and you know that they it's on the opposite side of the street you're supposed yeah, to look. Yeah, exactly. Look. Same as Australia. <laughs> I, he didn't look. And because I know, I pushed, when we were in Florence, I pushed him on the sidewalk, I don't know how many times. He was the type that loved architecture. So he'd walk in the middle of the road and i go, no. And I'd push him back on the sidewalk. That was an accident. He was not killed. He did not have anything, anybody wanted to shut him up about yeah. it. So yeah. he was not killed. That was I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to kind of clear that up because that that was my um I've I've read a lot of I don't know if you are familiar with Shirley MacLaine's books. She's she was a friend of John Max and she's wrote extensively about UFOs and consciousness and she's obviously interviewed with a lot of people to uncover information, but she did mention that in her books um about John. 
Well, yeah, and if you knew him, he was very absent-minded. So, but but he, you know, you want to hear the story behind that, which is really interesting. Yeah. Before he died, he was working with Russell Targ's um, daughter who was dying of cancer of a, of a tumor. And so when she did die, he, he did some experiments to see if she could tell her husband, communicate from the other side. Because, you know, near-death experiences and all this is connected with this. It is, whether people like it or not. And so what had happened is they were writing a manuscript together about after-death experiences. And John happened to say, I could do better research from the other side. Yeah. And you have to be careful because he's on the other side. And yeah. I'm going, oh, my God, John. Oh, I mean, I was devastated. I, I love that man. He reminds me a lot of Jacques Vallée, whom I'm working with now. These are men that have a, an intellect that you can't believe. They put it together. They have no pre preconceived notions. And mostly with John Mack, he was very kind. He, mm. he would listen. He, he would listen for hours. Um, and I, and I, who taught me that too was Alan Hynek. But in the beginning, I thought people were crazy. So I'd walk out of a room and say to Alan, Dr. J. Alan Hynek, I'd say, these people are crazy. Why do you listen to them? And he'd say, no. He'd say, the, the biggest thing you can do, he said, the greatest talent you can have is to be a good listener. You don't have to make a comment. You, you don't have to make a judgment, but you should listen. Mm -hmm. A, a thing that seldomly happens these days, unfortunately, I, I completely agree with you. I think we learn by listening. We learn by taking in information and experience and, and people are often too quick to want to respond to something before they actually absorb well, what someone is actually saying. Sarah, Sarah Brassman calls me and, you know, I, I like her and I bonded with her because she is like that. Mm -hmm. She is since she doesn't know where to put it she listens very carefully mm. and i think that's part of the hypnotherapy of 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 the you know the uh the interaction with the client you, you listen you in order to figure it out you, you can't ma start making judgments right away um i if i'm going to spend time with somebody i can tell right away um what the intention is if they want to have their own tv show if they want to bring, <laughs> yeah. they do, you know the people i like in latin america they, they don't care you can go up to them and you, you ask them did you ever see any, any strange people they go yes and they'll tell you and they'll go on and just keep walking mm. i mean it's no big deal and I realize that they have no intention to lie or to deceive you. So for me, gathering materials in, in Latin America, for me at my old age now, is easier than trying to, to navigate the mythology of ufology field here anymore. Because, mm. I, you know, I... I uh, I, I would pray that they would read each other's books. I, I, I always said, how could you get a degree and just read one book? <laughs> I, I mean, I have, <laughs> I, I have so I have 300 books. I mean, I've just read three new ones that just came out on Adamski. I read a Skinwalker Ranch book, yeah. Uh, yeah. Colm Keller. I mean, if I don't read these things, how do I, how could I piece together yeah. Ariel. I mean, what? I just read my own stuff, and then, you know, you get a degree because you read, you do your own research, and that's how you get a degree in, in, mm -hmm. in a sociology. It's no, you you need to to look at everybody's research. The sad mm -hmm. part, Paul, is that nobody talks to anybody about their research. No, I... they they take ownership. They think you're going to steal it or something, and they mm -hmm. they don't. Sh share anything so and for me in the field after 40 years I've become quite disillusioned you know it's a real shame I here's my view like you know I I tend to be featuring a lot of older people on my channels obviously heavily Dolores Cannon I've had Barbara Lamb on um, and you're probably familiar with Barbara Lamb because I think you 
move in similar circles with yeah, yeah. You know, with the conferences and so on. And I just have a reverence and respect for people that have been around for a long time, that are well researched, that are credible, that are articulate and intelligent. Um, I feel like that is missing a lot. And actually, it came across that, you know, some people felt like even Barbara was sort of too old so they didn't want to feature as much and I, I thought that was a real shame when I heard that because I thought here's someone with a 40 plus year career uh, in investigation and uh, uh, regression therapy she's been a part of writing a book so well researched so well invested in this area I just think it's such a shame when People don't have a reverence or respect. And, you know, it probably comes back to your Italian culture. And I'm here in Australia and we have a huge Italian community here. And I have a lot of very close friends that are Italian. And it's very much a part of their culture to have reverence and respect for older people, which seems to be missing in, you know, this time, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um one of the problems that, that I personally have, though, is when people make their um, living uh, doing this, I, I, you can't make a living doing this. Believe no. me. <laughs> so it's not every, when they come running up to me, go, I've been abducted. I said, no, you haven't. You've been contacted. You haven't been abducted. You're, you're speaking to me. If you were abducted, they would have taken you away, slit your throat, thrown you in the dumpster, and that's abduction. <laughs> and so, but I, and the problem is that we can't convince everybody they've been abducted. And but if you're making your living that way, it's very, very tricky, Paul, um, because contact is different. Contact means that you have something that uh, opened up you to another dimension. Mm. And it, it's, it's, in other words, it, it helped you open your mind and open your, your whole view. But it's very difficult for people uh, to make a living from that. The reason why they, most of my colleagues, and I'm the only one other than Timothy Good and Wendell Stevens that went all over the world. The rest of them never went anywhere. They mm. can't afford it. <laughs> it comes from your own pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Every I time know. I get down, I'm about, about ready to go to Socorro tomorrow, it's going to cost me $1,000. I have to go back with Jacques Belay. It costs $1,000. I mean, you stay in a hotel, you got to rent a car, you have the airplane fare. And people like my kids go, Mom, why don't you go to the Bahamas and go swimming <laughs> in the, yeah. you know, and have kids in your old age? Why in the world are you going to South America? So you've got, to, I've got to watch that who I'm talking to has done field research, not from their home on the phone. It's like, I have to connect all the stories around the world to know what the devil is going on. But I have sacrificed a tremendous ton of money because I've never had a sponsor, uh, you know, in early days um rockefeller what's his name um lawrence gave a lot of money he gave quite a bit of money to our research including john mack he gave because yeah, he would bring everybody to rockefeller ranch and he, he'd say give us a proposal what do you want to find out and he gave tons of money bigelow there's a lot of people i've never been part of that group um also because i i didn't want to count to anybody for the research because I didn't know what I was going to get. I didn't, you, in other words, sometimes there's a, an agenda behind it. As far as respecting Barbara Lamb, yes. Respecting John Mack, yes. But what, what I'm looking at, I don't know how old you are, but there's nobody in the young people field that has taken over. My stuff is going to, right now, all behind me, those white cabinets, I have I have eight of them. All my stuff is going to Rice University. All the audio tapes, the the photographs, the artifacts. I even have pieces of UFO. I mean, I've collected these. They're going to a university, mm. but, but I'm really discouraged because there's no people your age that are taking over this yeah, in, in a serious in a serious way. I, I so agree. I go yeah. 
I go to conferences and there's nobody in that conference room that I'm speaking to 200 people who is less than 70 years old. Yes. And I'm going, my God, what's going to happen here? All mm. this work that we did, all this, all this accumulation, you know, mine is going to Rice, but even the kids that are going to go to Rice University and look up my stuff, Jacques Vallée stuff, John Max stuff, Wendell Stevens stuff, Clifford Stone stuff is all there. They're not going to know what they're looking at. They're not going to know what, what it is. And I, I, I don't know who your following is, but if you have a passion to find out something about us, our planet, the universe, and the reason for any kind of visitation other than the atomic bomb that was exploded, mm -hmm. um, please uh, come forth because people like us, and I am, uh, I'll tell you right now, I'm 78 years old. So I, I, you know, I'm very- Wow, well, you, you don't look, let me just pause for a sec. You do not look 78 years old. I had no idea. Um, well, well, and- I am, and, I'm, and Barbara, I'm probably <laughs> older than you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but no, I was having this conversation with my father last night, actually, when we went out for dinner. I, you know, even 78 isn't, really really old like it is like it used to be i mean i i had one grandmother that lived you know to a hundred years old you know she wanted a letter from the queen and she said she'd be, stay for the letter from the queen she got it and then a month later she had died um but you know i i i i believe it's a mindset you know it really is mindset when it comes to it so 78 might seem old but i you know i think you've got <laughs> Quite some time to keep working. Yeah, so I'll be around. I'll be around. But the, the the point is still that we need younger people. Okay. I I totally agree, and there does seem to be a you know a bit of a disconnect from generation to generation. It's something that frustrates me personally, and people that follow this channel and obviously know because I'm a uh, a Dolores Cannon practitioner. I speak a lot about her legacy, a lot about her work. I feature a lot of her videos. I know you would have had personal crossover with Dolores because you moved in similar circles no, of I conferences. Yeah, I, I knew her. I knew Dolores Cannon. It, it, it would it help if I tell you a story uh, that the, the young people should know? Um, in, in the early days, uh, uh, there was a, a researcher named Andrea Poharich that worked with the remote viewing group, especially Ur Uri Geller. And, and he um, he worked with a psychic medium named Phyllis Schlemmer. And Phyllis wrote a book called The Only Planet of Choice. It, people have to read. And there's two chapters on Gene Roddenberry, who made Star Trek, channeling the Council of Nine, who are kind of cybernetic ETs. And, and you know, you got, if you watch Star Trek, there's Deep Space Nine, everything is nine. Well, come on. Yeah. Star Trek has greater following than anything that ever was. And when I was at the Star Trek convention, there were 3,000, 4,000 people there. So these are all young people. So yeah. the effort for Roddenberry to bring in sci-fi which isn't sci-fi it's really the future and these people these young kids hooking up was i mean the intelligence community knows it i mean blade runner philip dick uh, uh minority report well you know even so as you even if you're saying that it's reminding me of you know the number one show on netflix was Stranger Things. And I don't know if you're aware of that show, but that show is based on the Montauk Project. And it was the number one show about kids with I, psychic abilities and uh, different abilities and uh, a, a facility there. I mean, this stuff's really popular in the mainstream when you, you know, put it out there as sci-fi or fantasy. However, we know that this stuff is based on, on factual stuff. Yeah, well, I interviewed Al Beely, the Monta, uh, you know, the uh, Philadelphia experiment. There's pictures of me and Al Beely all over the uh, the internet. Um, it's hard to wrap your mind around, mm -hmm. but it, 
I mean, I, he was telling the truth in so many ways, but it's just hard to understand dimensionality that you could be in one dimension in one minute and another in another, because we don't understand, because our, our, our science hasn't caught up with that. It's yes. like the scientists go, well, if, if it isn't in science, it's not real. Well, how about a break? You've got to invent, like Colonel Corso used to tell me, they've got to invent a new science to accommodate this. There has to be. So then they, they invented, yeah, they start talking about entanglement, quantum physics, how the, how you know um, how everything is united? Well, then go back to the Buddhist philosophy that they already knew that, and there's a lot of philosophies in the world that know that you can that you can actually uh, project thought. That I mean, when Edgar, Edgar Mitchell talked to me, he said, <laughs> "This is Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 on the moon." He said that without permission. He did psychic experiments from the moon and they were 99, 90%. He said 90% accurate from the moon with your thoughts. Wow. So I'm going, Edgar, is that why you didn't be a, an engineer anymore when you came back? <laughs> he said, enough with engineering. I'm going to do noetic sciences and I'm going to prove with entanglement and quantum physics that you know all this stuff exists. And, and he said, yes, he said, because he lived it. If, if, if he's sending thoughts from the moon, can you imagine how powerful your thought is? Yeah, well, the, the, this is, I think, what we're through consciousness, we're waking up to now is understanding, uh, you know, that we have power, that we create our reality with our thoughts. And we do it even if we are conscious or not. You know, people create a reality they don't want unintentionally. <laughs> We see it all the time, but people are coming, you know, to understand that in the world of consciousness, that was the next question I had for you. How is your, and obviously I want to talk about your books as well, the crossover between the research and your own journey into consciousness. How did all of that happen for you? Well, first of all, I realized that everything was a coincidence, but <laughs> it wasn't a coincidence. Yeah. I always, I always have this conversation with Jacques Vallée. I say, "Who's guiding this thing? Who's a puppet master here?" Yes, yeah, you good. know, <laughs> who's who's telling me? I mean, a, an example: when I went to do the Philip Corso story, there was no room in Roswell. It was a big party. It was everybody in the world was there. Everybody that you ever heard of was there, and I, I didn't have a place to sleep, but I was told by my magazine I had to cover the story. So I just went to the, the media place and I said, I, I, I gotta sleep here, I don't have a car. And they said, open up the, you know, open up the phone book and, and look. And the first hotel was the Sally Port Inn. They had a room for three days that was next to Colonel Corso. So I was there to, to do the Corso story. Nobody could get around uh, with him because Simon and Schuster kept him sequestered. So Paul gets a room next to him. So, you know, and, and my whole life has been coincidences. And I thought, all right, well, you know, don't worry about anything. Somebody's pulling the strings here. And then I realized maybe it's me that's pulling the strings and a higher self and a whole bunch of stuff that I don't understand. So then I had to shift into that we're living in a sea of consciousness. And then I had to start reading about it. I have to start understanding it because that's the only way it made sense. But it means that, and, and I always say this, Paul, the graduate school of ufology is consciousness. Mm -hmm. If you haven't read that, and consciousness includes psychic ability, quantum physics, time, the fact that there is no time, the idea, and a, a lot of and a lot of the Buddhist philosophy too. It's really really interesting, but if you haven't reached graduate school and you're back in elementary school, where you know, unfortunately, we're looking at the craft and how fast it goes. You know, it, it, we didn't come very far. We we didn't we didn't really progress, did we? Mm. Yeah, it's such a good point. Um, you know, I love that 
you know, Dolores Cannon actually covered this concept really well. I think she articulated it better than anyone I've heard. You know, time isn't happening at the same time. It's existing in the same time, at the same time. So it's almost like it's stacked on top of each other. And our limited focus in this human experience is this being a solidified world. But when you understand we're more than this physical experience that we have in some called the higher self and the over soul where the totality of information is beyond form, it's timeless, right? And many wisdom traditions talk about the timeless essence beyond form. Um, but I love it that Buddhism, wisdom, tradition, science are now kind of merging more than we've ever seen before. Um, and a lot of these concepts we're finding really are, you know, they're synonymous with each other from the scientific world to wisdom, tradition and consciousness. Yeah, and people want you to define find consciousness and I just say it's the awareness that you exist and everything around you it's just awareness uh and the awareness that you are part of every single solitary cell and atom that exists uh it's like Sting says we are spirits in a material world you know Sting and police uh and those guys are so and they they should look at music because those guys are so wise, those rock stars. David Bowie, I mean, my God, they already knew these things and they're trying to put them in music so people understand. Um, and people say, well, why don't the ETs come down and say they exist? Well, because we create another religion around them. Uh, he's, because, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so what we create religions or heroes around everything. And in the end, we're the hero. We're it. it we're all of it. And uh, in order to get to that point where we realize that at, at my age, I mean, my God, I, you couldn't have talked to me like this 40 years ago. I just, I, I was just mystified. I was gathering data. I, I lived my whole life gathering data, data, data. And it was usually with very credible people. Mm -hmm. um so you know now i'm gathering data in latin america with regular people because they don't think it's weird down there mm -hmm. they think it's normal <laughs> they say of course the space brothers you know they of course of course we're part of something else of course you know uh, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story I, I have so many of them but this this blew me away when i was studying the giant rock people uh, you know, Van Tassel, Adamski, Howard Manger, Orfeo, Orfeo Angelucci, a whole bunch of them that I covered. I, I uh, began um, reading a book called We Are Here, Visitors Without Passports. And the author was Michel Zerger, who's a French writer who lives in Tokyo. He married a woman in Tokyo. And I did an interview with him. And if you want the interview, it's on my YouTube channel. I have fantastic interviews with these people. And I said, Michelle, you worked so hard on Adamski and you bought all George Hunt Williamson's archives. Do you think you ever met an ET? And he said, let me tell you a story. My wife and I, she's Japanese, we went into a restaurant and I was working with the Adamski case, and you know Ortha, whom Adamski met in Desert Sun, who was blonde hair, blue eye. He said, these two young men, very much like male models, they were perfectly beautiful, with blonde hair, short blonde hair, though, and blue eyes walked in. And he said he looked at them, and he thought in his mind, I wonder if they are from here. So they went, and they had their dinner, and he had his dinner with his wife. And on the way out, in French, not even in Japanese, in French, they left a napkin and said, Nous sommes ici in French, we are here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, that, and that isn't science fiction. That mm. really happened. Because I think on some level, whoever the ETs are, if you're doing work about them, or, and he wrote several books, Michel Zerger's a genius he wrote several books great he's french but he lives in tokyo 
Um, what are they doing walking into a Tokyo restaurant with, with a napkin in French saying we are here? It's, mm. you know, then I have to say, oh my God, I mean, it could be like down the street riding a bicycle. It's, mm. and, and, and it's no different from us, but it's a matter of studying this, this, um, the subject matter seriously. I mean, I get upset every time I go to a conference and all these blow up little gray aliens or a little green men are off over there because I always say, if you do this, no self-respecting um, scientist is going to walk into this conference and have some pretty cool speakers here. I yeah. like scientists to walk in and just sit in the back, you know, and 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 say, oh, these are some pretty cool speakers. But they're not going to do that with all all the the circus, the the selling of all the T-shirts. Yeah. The, well, the that's the, that that was exactly my point earlier. Is you know, it's frustrating for me because you know I respect this research research like yours and so many others that have put in years and years of of research and 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 really well. Um, documented evidence and then you get the circus show <laughs> the, you know selling the t-shirts people embellishing information for maybe they think financial gain or attention particularly younger people tend to do this you've probably seen them come come and even well, go I, I think they have experiences I think that they maybe don't know how to interpret it because I believe, like what works near Balducci, there's all level of angels. You know, I mean, there's there's like all kinds of levels of stuff that mm. isn't e it's not ET. Well, uh, let's look at know, that for a moment. Yeah, let's look at that for a moment. That's another question that came up. Obviously, you had um that relationship with him and him being with the Vatican. Uh do you feel, and a, and a lot of conservative Christians will, because I often get this argument online, will say, oh, you know, you're dealing with demons here. These are demons. These are, you know, this is the devil or the whatever. What would you say about that sort of interdimensional thing on a negative side? No, the problem is you attract what you want. And and um, uh, Monsignor Balducci, who was a demonologist, okay, he was an exorcist. Yeah, <laughs> okay, said, right. <laughs> he was a demonologist. Listen, people, I mean, you want to get it from the horse's mouth? I don't go out in the street. I got to go to the demon. He said, the devil doesn't eat folks. And then he said, he said, whatever's out there is a lot more evolved than we are because we are very primitive species. We're yeah. still killing each other. We have pedophile, we have all the stuff on this planet that I don't think ETs have on their planet necessarily. And he said, in the scale of evolution, God created many civilizations on many planets that are evolving. And he goes, and I felt really bad. He said, and we are the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like- No doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be the bottom of the barrel. And he goes, and we are the bottom of the barrel. And he was a demonologist. So mm. what uh, uh, an organized religion would have to do a serious study of this phenomena because there are demons. And I think there are you know, evil spirits, but they're not E.T. Mm. It, it's, what, it's what's out there. You can't have good without having evil. That, uh, yeah, but, that's a good point. Um, well, how can you have good if you don't have anything to balance it with? The other thing is that there are angels, there are spirits, there are interdimensional beings. Uh, I mentioned the Council of Nine. Those are cybernetic. They, they're just intelligences that don't have bodies. And, and there's a whole bunch of, of stuff out there that, that it, it, it's so exciting to study. I wish people would just go to college and study it. <laughs> mm. Well, we're moving into a time now, you know, there's been a lot in the media lately about artificial intelligence. And I've listened to arguments on both sides of all the positive, you know, things that can transpire from it, but also a lot of fear around where it can potentially lead in a negative direction. Did you have some views on 
artificial intelligence as it's starting to now permeate into the public sphere? Well, you know, um, if you go on my YouTube channel again, there's a panel because I used to do the Laughlin conferences in Laughlin, Nevada, near Las Vegas. I had a, a panel on artificial intelligence because I had advanced kinds of things. I wasn't into the circus. Uh, and there's Jacques Vallée, Paul Hynek, the son of J. Allen Hynek. There's Paul Smith, who is president of Remote Viewing Society. And there's a genius kid. I mean, these kids, when they go, named uh, Adam Curry, who was on that panel. And they talked, and, and go on my YouTube and watch it, because they talked about the pros and cons of it. Like people like Paul uh, Hynek said, I'd rather uh, uh, a, a artificial intelligence drove a car than a regular human. <laughs> he says, like, so he had like one view. I got, well, that's, that's really, uh, you know, interesting. But I had a pilot friend in Rome when I was there who used to talk to the airplane and they were connected, man. Th that machine was connected to the pilot. So then I'm thinking, okay, then are ETs connected to their craft? Is it all one? And then if it is all one and you have a relationship, then it's the intention that makes it bad. It is not the artificial intelligence by itself. It is whoever is messing with it and what the intention is. Because mm. I don't think artificial intelligence by itself thinks of evil. It's it's power, it's greed, it's those things that we have on planet Earth. But there's so I, a Siri on my phone is artificial Thanks. intelligence. Yeah, I said this to someone um, the other day. It's been out for a while. We've had Siri for quite a few years yeah. now. <laughs> I mean, so it, what are you arguing about? It's there. It's just, you know... I, I, I sound old fashioned, but if you have a cell phone and you're going for a walk, leave it in the car, go hear the birds, go nice. hear nature, get back to yourself because you can't live with in, uh, technology 24 seven. Then you will become artificial, like artificial intelligence. Know that you still have a beautiful planet. Know that there are times where you leave everything behind and get back to yourself uh and you know and, and relationships and nature and that's up to the human being there's nobody dictating that evil to us mm, yeah i i agree we 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 have been given stewardship over this planet at least as you know the intelligent species that we are and we haven't cared for the planet as as much as we should have been but I think a lot of us are waking up to that. I think there's more conscious now, uh, consciousness rather around the planet than there was 20 years ago. I've certainly seen a big shift uh, in, you know, the way we view the planet. Um, but we've still got a long way to go, uh, I think. I wanted well, to get... Don't your... You don't bring your cell phone with you when you're going for a walk. Yeah, great, I mean, I... great point. Oh, I'm walking in the beautiful, beautiful, Beautiful Rocky Mountains with their cell phone. They don't even know they're alive. I mean, there is a time for artificial intelligence and technology. You leave it at home, or there's a time for being human. And and I would encourage people to control it. Not that it's evil, but control it. Yeah. Well, it it comes back to that thing of balance, doesn't it? You know, I mean, like the moment you're unbalanced with anything, it becomes, you know, destructive in one's life. I think right. it's like that with technology. I mean, the kids obviously learn very differently now through technologies now in education, but if they're always on that and they're not getting into nature or they're not getting out and being physical, of course, then that's going to be negative for those individuals. Um, I think this is sort of, <laughs> you know, you, you would imagine it would be more well accepted, but, you know, you, you see some kids now, they don't even get out into the street as kids. Now they're on their video games or they're on their computer or I device would... all the time. Yes, but let's have hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I tend to be an optimist. 
I wanted to ask you about um, what we were discussing earlier, and that was uh, time travel uh, in, I think, South America. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about what you uncovered in this particular project? You were... Well, uh, I, I come, uh, came to meet Ricardo Gonzalez. The names of the book are Contact from Planet Apu, and um, the other one is The Ark. Ricardo Gonzalez lives in Peru, contactee, physical contact. I, I went to the Chilka Desert where he met Antaral. Antaral says he's us from the future. Antaral is a Apunian. And he told Ricardo that um, the Apunians have a base in the mountain of Huascaran, which is the highest mountain uh, in the world, really, if you count from the bottom, it's higher than Everest. But um, so I went on a journey with Ricardo and a film crew, Rob Freeman's film crew, to Huascaran. And uh, what happened there was in the 1970s, a group of, of Apunians who dressed like space people went to a hydroelectric plant and told the Russian leader there, Vlado Kapitanovich, there's going to be an earthquake in a month in Yungai. Half of the mountain is going to come off and kill the people. Will you go and tell the authorities to move the people? They had seen it. They knew it. So, uh, uh, and this is all documented. Kapitanovich uh, told the authorities they did not move the people. The earthquake happened. 45,000 people died. And I walked over their graves because they didn't even put them in the, the ground. They just put dirt over the whole village. And I was walking over the village. These uh, Punians told Ricardo that they were us from the future, that the earth had had a uh, catastrophe, and that, that they had to take the children off the planet in a place called Alma in Chile. Alma is 15,000 feet. Ricardo went there. He went there for curiosity. But it, when he went to Alma, there is radio telescopes from China, NASA, United States, Russia, all in that spot. So did the Apunians take the kids off the planet because we had a catastrophe? Did they inhabit uh, a planet named Apu in Alpha Centauri. The scientists found a new planet in Alpha Centauri. Are they us from the future coming to say that we have a choice, that there are several timelines, mm -hmm. that if we screw up, it's going to happen the way it happened? That's the, the, They are genetically uh, crossed with us. I have to sit down and think about it, okay? I have to think about this because this did happen. It's documented. And there is a place called Alma and in, in Quechua, it means liftoff. So, you know, where this Alma in Chile is very interesting. People want to do research on it, but read Ricardo's books because the contact he has is with people that genetically mixed with us because they took the kids off the planet. And and um, I've heard this, Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke says this, yeah. the overlords came and took the kids. Uh, I don't want to believe it's true, but those space people did go to Vlado and they did tell him to move the people because there was an earthquake. So if you're collecting data, there's data all over the place. Mm. It's just very difficult for me as a regular person to wrap my mind around it. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. What years are we talking uh, that this contact okay. happened? Okay, when did the contact happen? I have yeah. to go back to the book and see. It was okay. at least 20 years ago. Okay, so, ago. so, and do you <laughs> think that that was their continued contact with, with that group of people? Um, over time or did it sort of end after that earthquake experience no no um 
Antaral has appeared in the in the Chilka Desert, not Chilka in Atacama, uh, and uh, has brought other people with him physically, wow. uh, so that Cado and his group have physically interacted with it. I mean, it's hard, but I mean, so there's space people. I mean, there's all kinds of different people. So mm. it, it physically, and 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 Sisto Paz usually has ten people with him. Sisto was telling me that when they would meditate and they would fast, and I'd say, why did you do that? And he goes, because it, it, uh, in, in, in digestion, you don't, get, you don't get the messages as clearly. So they would fast in the Chilka Desert of Peru. The, the craft would land, and these young guys, there were 10 of them, the, the, the ETs or the space guys would say, come on in, come on in, and they went in. Hmm. And I interviewed them. Individually, and they're all telling the same story. They're not all lying. Un unfortunately or fortunately, a group always uh, comes around them, and that's the Rama group. So remember I said we tend to create ideologies around this, and, and then it becomes tricky because it became the Rama group, and, and uh, you know, we, we formed an idea, they formed an ideology, and they don't all agree. But these things really did happen. I mean, the B and B where I stayed in in, um, in near Awaskaran in in Yungay, the B and B, uh, I, I you could see the mountain. Uh, there's a movie. It's called uh, Making Contact. People can see it because we were in it. And and I went to the woman. She was making us sandwiches. The little old lady. And I said, Did you ever see the people there? And she said, Yeah, they came to speak to my kids when they were ten years old. Mm. And she kept making the sandwiches. <laughs> yes, I to not phased by it. <laughs> I'm famous. Talk to me because I know everything. She kept making the sandwiches, and I said, "You actually saw these people?" She said, "Yeah, they walk up and down the trails, but they came into my children's bedroom when they were ten years old." So I'm going, Paula. You better do your work here because you're getting the purest. Uh, you're getting the purest testimony. Yeah, and all you can do is get testimony. So you talk to the people on the streets and you talk to people in the fields and you talk to, because all my life I've talked to military people, intelligence people, astronauts. Mm. I did all that. I did all. I need to talk to the people contact, the real people contacted. Mm. Mm. I was reading just, I, just before. I, I, yeah. No, no, you go. I did, I, did, you, did I answer what time, tra how confusing time travel is? Yeah, well, I, I think it's certainly, well, it, it's hard to get your head around, I think, with the human mind, isn't it? Yeah, because there's several timelines. And when you change one thing, you change the whole timeline. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about that for the audience so they can understand how that kind of works with timelines? Well, it's in my book. So that I can put it. It's in this Yeah, book. can you show yeah. us? And you've got another book there too. Yeah, Trinity with Jacques Vallée, it's a bestseller. It's about okay. the first crash. By the way, the seven-year-old here uh, got a vision of 9-11. He got a vision. The seven-year-old never saw a skyscraper, and he got a vision of people falling out of skyscrapers. Wow. So uh, yeah. at, at 1945, he never saw a skyscraper. Tell me about that. Um, wow. An example could be, I, I, I use it in my book, Connecting the Dots, it's coming out in May. Now, um, where can people, if, Connecting the Dots, it's coming out in May. Where can people purchase that? Will it be available on Amazon? Yeah, all on, uh, only on Amazon. We self-publish, Jacques and I, and I, May 1st. Uh, this has psychic remote viewers here it has it has everything time travel it has jack valet it has john mack it has everybody um but what i want to say is to make it under to make you understand um i was living in rome and um there was a prediction supposedly from the apparitions in fatima that the fifth uh message which is so secret or the fourth message was that a Bishop dressed in white would die and would be filled with blood, would die. And supposedly John Paul the uh, Twenty-third, um, you know, he read it, the Polish Pope. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. he 
uh, and you know he was driving around St. Peter's Square. Now, Fatima had three children. The oldest that lived, her name was Lucia, and she went into the convent and was a nun for many years, and it was Lucia that made up the, uh, the messages of Fatima. So I was there. John Paul was shot as he was going around, but he was shot by a, uh, a man named Ali. But because he was a very crowded Ali and a nun named Lucia gave him an elbow, he couldn't point the gun where he killed the Pope. He just wounded him. Well, that changed history. That guy was supposed to be dead, according to the timeline. Ah, so, very interesting. Yeah, so that's so. John Paul knew that, so he took the bullet and he put it in the crown of Our Lady of Fatima in Portugal. And by the way, that that was a UFO event. The sun was not the sun that came out of the sky, because there's books written on Fatima. And I met the the uh, the uh, the. Uh, the guy Hernandez from Portugal who said what came out of the sky was a big round metallic thing. <laughs> and it was in 19, uh, it was 1913, I think, May 13th, 1913 or 1917, maybe 1917, way back when. And so I use that as an example that the, the, the uh, synchronicity is her name was Lucia. She was another she. She elbowed Ali, so he couldn't point the gun perfectly. And that Pope ended up going all over the world, in Israel, in, in, in Orthodox Russia, trying to bring the world together. He did a lot of good because he wasn't actually killed. It but if he was killed, it would have changed an entire timeline. Mm. So uh, it's like a bunch of chains when you take the link out you jump to another cause and effect. So yeah. I don't know if that helps you understand timelines. And the Apunians are hoping that we come together before we destroy what's ultimately going to be destroyed if everybody plays around with nuclear. It's a chess game. Mm -hmm. The only way that you win a chess game is stalemate. Uh, you know, what oh, is a checkmate? So yeah. what do we need to do, Paul? Always be in checkmate. Mm -hmm. You know, they got to have as many as we got to have, and then that's checkmate. And, and uh, I mean, we, the world, has uh, as much nuclear. They, we can't go on playing checkmate, and nobody's going to give up their, their weapons. So what we're hoping for is an event or some kind of events, and maybe we're responsible with our minds. We could do it with our minds. To make us jump the timeline. Yeah, I don't know. Did I, get, did I give you enough to think about? No, I mean, <laughs> you articulated that perfectly, and I mean, it goes along with so much of what people are talking about now. We in a higher consciousness community, the community. Uh, Dolores Cannon spoke a lot about it in her probably most popular book. Uh, the Three Waves of Volunteers and the New Earth. I don't know if you've read that book personally, but that covers a lot of this from regression therapy that she had over a, quite a number of years. Um, so she was obviously very optimistic, obviously about these events that had occurred in our time, the atomic bomb that went off in Hiroshima and Hiroshima back in the World War II. Um, but that started a... Uh, a volunteer, which she defined them as the volunteers incarnating to help raise the consciousness and the vibration of the planet so that it could, we would begin to operate with a new consciousness. And then she referenced obviously new earth being what the book of Re revelations talks about in the Bible is John's um, prophetic uh, seeing is I saw a new heaven and a new earth and ushering in a thousand years of peace. So a lot of this has been discussed and it's been around for a very long time. And people like Dolores Cannon and others have come along and, 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 and sort of added to that. Are you sort of of that mind view? I don't know if you've read that book. 
No, because I think what's in progress, I think there is nothing cast in stone. I think we make a decision every day. And I, like I think that. Yeah. the only thing I can tell you is stay positive. Know that your thoughts count. If we come, we're, you know, if we come together, nobody can do anything. You know, it, it, it's, it's everybody has to come together. Everybody has to come together. Um, and what we want for the children of the future is not dividing, but, but inclusion, inclusion. And so if there's a new earth, it's because we have to create it, uh, uh, but, but we have to create it out of being, uh, you know, intelligent humans. I mean, th there's so much craziness going on out there right now that I, I, <laughs> I, I, tell me. I are, are people nuts? Don't they realize that their, their actions have consequences that go on forever? Um, and, you know, it, it's it's really tricky, but it, I'm I'm pop, I'm optimistic too. I mean, I, I'll be optimistic, but intelligently optimistic means you need to study everything. It, it isn't just off the top of your head. Mm -hmm. I mean, half the concepts I talked about today I could not have talked about twenty years ago, uh, because I couldn't wrap like you said. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Um, my, my, uh, qualities are that I never put anything in a box. I, I don't make sense of it. It's not in a religious box. It's not in a political box. It's not in an age box. I just don't know. And I can go around and give you an answer saying, I have no idea. <laughs> it's fun. The journey is fun. I don't necessarily need the answers. Oh, I like that. Because a lot of people are desperate for the answers, so they don't enjoy the journey or the research or the, you know, the exploration to get there because they need to know definitively black and white. And I've always found that life is a million or millions of shades of grey. And sometimes there isn't a definitive answer or there's many answers to the one question. But the journey itself is really the destination. If you can embody that and think like what you said, I think that's an incredible piece of wisdom that you're leaving with us. Oh, I'm having fun. I mean, I I, I, I want to know. I mean, I've met all the most important people ever, but I, I, I don't want to stop work. I don't want to stop searching, you know, and there is no answer. The answer is there is no answer. So if the answer is there is no answer, then let's let's go play. Let's play in this in this sandbox uh, and don't put it in a box. Mm -hmm. And and the world is not filled with reptilians, grays, and nordics. And get off of that. If Clifford Stone has a manual of 57 different species, get real. You know, come on. Uh, I hate to deal with people that just narrow it down. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to ask you is if. Uh, I can uh, give you my website. It's www.paola, because I'm Italian, P A O L A, Paola Harris, um, dot com. And all my work is on there. Beautiful. And you've got a YouTube channel. What's your YouTube uh, channel if people want to search for your videos on YouTube? Paola, just Paola Harris, P A O L Harris. Okay. Uh, yeah. And and it's everybody. It's the South Americans, the Latin Americans. It's everything I ever did. Uh, and, and you know they can. And I'd rather that they got it from the horses, from the other people, than from me. Because my job, even in these books, is just to put question and answer. It's I ask the great questions, and they give the answers. Because there's very little of what I believe in here, because I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's why I love your work so much because you are a diligent researcher. Uh, you have such incredible connections, such a wealth of knowledge. You're a very articulate and intelligent person. I loved chatting with you today. And I, hey, I hope that one day you'll come back uh, and chat to me again. Um, in May, what date does the book come out on Amazon? When can people have a look for your book? Probably May 6th. May 6th. Uh, connecting the dots comes out May 6th, but they need to read about the atomic bomb and that crash. The, this book is already out, Trinity, with me and Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée, again, was the scientist 
Spielberg's movie Close Encounters. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know. And if people are also interested in Jack Fillet's work, where can they find more of his work? Um, it's on Amazon too. I mean, he he has a publisher, but his if people want to know the real story, his diaries, which are called Forbidden Knowledge, one, two, three, four, and five, his personal diaries has the real story in there. Yeah, well, okay, incredible. Now, I know a lot of people will be interested. Diaries, and people don't even know. You know what it is? They're not reading. People people want to get it quick and easy on YouTube. Somebody's <laughs> uh, rehashed, digested <laughs> opinion. Somebody's rehashed, digested opinion. They don't go to the regular, the, the horse's mouth. If you're studying uh, Einstein, you don't want to talk to the person who knew him. You want to talk to Einstein, and you read what Einstein wrote. And you don't want to go to five generations who knew him later. Uh, it's I believe in going to the source, but then I'm a teacher. I'm, I I wouldn't give you a good grade if you handed me a paper and it was all YouTube. <laughs> yeah, no, you you raise a very good point, and I think that reading is you know one of the most important. Like I I'm so glad that I've read as much as I have because it's never quite the same this listening to someone's review or watching a youtube video you you go, you go in deep when you're absorbing someone's someone's book um thank you so much for coming on again it's been a pleasure <laughs> to have you on um it's been so fascinating i've had a thousand questions for you i only got through about <laughs> half of them so you'll have to come back on sometime 